Well, Managing Director, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with CNBC. Uh, the world has experienced several shocks over the last couple of years. You think about the pandemic, the energy crisis emanating from Europe, inflation, monetary policy tightening, all of these ha things happening at the same time. Let me just start off by asking you how you would characterize global growth right now. On the positive side, uh, the resilience of the world economy has been remarkable. We have avoided recession that we so much feared may be coming our way uh, this year. And uh, we see that uh, consumer demand remains quite strong in most countries. Labor markets are tight, but this recovery is slow and uneven. We looked at the impact of scarring from the two shocks, $3.7 trillion lost. More importantly, divergence, how these losses are being distributed. The US is the only large economy that has fully recovered. Uh, Eurozone, 2% below their pre-COVID trend. Uh, emerging markets, 4 5% low-income countries, 6% below pre-pandemic trend. And when we look into the future, what we see is anemic growth. We project growth at 3% on average over the next five years. Before the pandemic, it was 3.8% on average in the previous uh, decade. When you frame the numbers like that, what stands out to me is the huge divergence we're seeing between advanced economies and also low-income countries. Why is it so pronounced? The divergence is, is driven by a multiplicity of factors. Number one, how much fiscal space you have. Uh, advanced economies, they put in the equivalent of 28% of GDP in support to their people and their businesses, low-income countries, 2%. Uh, secondly, how impacted you are from the high energy and food prices. Uh, low-income countries, just by the virtue of, of being relatively poor, they get, hit, they get hit dramatically. And then comes the strength of institutions and policies. And we see within the low-income countries also difference. Some, those that build strong fundamentals are actually performing better. Countries like Cote d'Ivoire or Senegal, those that have been uh, drifting into coups and political instability, uh, like Niger and Sudan and Burkina Faso, they're in a very difficult uh, place. And the last point is debt. How much you are burdened by borrowing with interest rates up and dollar strong, meaning local currencies depreciate, this burden of debt is becoming unbearable uh, for a very large number of countries. 15% of low-income countries are already hit. Another 35, 40% are close to that uh, place. What do we need? Well, we need countries to do the right thing, strengthen your policies, build reforms to last, and we need the international community to stand by them. At the IMF, uh, we, we have done unthinkable things over the last three years. We have injected $1 trillion through special drawing rights and, and lending into the world economy. And we have particularly targeted for support low-income countries. We are going now to Marrakesh. There, we want to make sure we have this strength for them. I want to ask you more about the U.S. economy because it sounds to me like it is a relative bright spot when you think about the outlook. Uh, do the IMF forecast a recession? And if that is not the baseline for the U.S. economy, why do you think it has been so much more resilient than other economies in the world? We do not project the recession in our baseline. And actually, the most recent developments in the U.S. Uh, 
make soft lending even more uh, likely. Uh, what we see is first, inflation is starting to go down. The actions of the Fed are paying off. Uh, second, consumer demand remains strong, despite the fact that savings that were accumulated during COVID are melting and uh, labor markets are very tight. Uh, what the US is benefiting as well is less dependency on energy imports. So they didn't get the same shock uh, Europe uh, had to uh, suffer uh, when uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. Many central bankers around the world have started to use the phrasing rates are getting close to or at sufficiently restrictive levels to bring inflation back down to target. Do you think that this fight against inflation is now over? Is it mission accomplished for policymakers and central bankers? In some countries, yes. Um, look at Brazil, for example. Uh, in the US, the Fed is now thoroughly monitoring to see whether uh, maybe time has come to pause. Uh, in some countries, not quite yet. And this is very important to recognize that we have to be data dependent and countries standing is diverging even within advanced economies, within emerging markets. Where success has been achieved is mostly because countries stepped up in tightening early and were vigilant. And now the payoff is in their hands. So what is our advice to central uh, uh, banks? First, continue to be vigilant. We cannot afford to lose the fight against inflation because we would undermine consumer and investor confidence and we would affect growth. Second, be data dependent. Third, communicate your intentions clearly. Let me ask you about China. I think one of the biggest disappointments to the global growth outlook has been the faltering recovery out of China, particularly in light of the data we've seen the, over the last couple of months. What is the IMS assessment of, on what is happening on the ground there? And to what extent do you think some of these drivers are actually just structural going forwards and not just cyclical? When we look at uh, China's performance, indeed, China had a good first quarter and then it started losing momentum. Very likely they would land around 5% growth for this year. But remember in the beginning of the year, we were projecting 5.2%. Why China matters? Because if China loses 1% growth, this translates into 0.3% loss of growth for the rest of Asia. It affects the rest of the uh, world. What we see in China are three problems China needs to navigate. The real estate, local government debt, and the long-term impact of demographic uh, developments in China. So China can uh, move to a more consumer-driven growth model. They have 1.4 billion people, 400 million of them are middle class, but this would take significant structural reforms, pension reform, so people don't feel like they have to save, hold their money rather than spend it, uh, making social protection more agile. The relations between the central government and the local government. So there is a fiscal position that strengthens local governments. And above all, think about demography seriously. Think about structural changes and what are the skills that are necessary. And continue what China was doing in the previous decades, opening up. So comp competitive forces can lift uh, up growth. Well, back in April, when I was in Washington, I remember one of the chapters of the World Economic Outlook was specifically about geoeconomic fragmentation. To what extent do you think that is also derailing global growth prospects, particularly in light of the uh, export restrictions that we're seeing in China, the deterioration in the diplomatic channels between China and the U.S. right now? 
Well, we certainly see uh, fragmentation uh, throwing cold water on what is, in any case, weak growth prospect. Uh, since 2017, trade restrictions increased six times from 500 to 3,000 today. And when you restrict the flow of goods, inevitably that leads to higher costs. And that translates into price pressures undesirable at the time of uh, high inflation. We would like to see thoughtful approach to what is a reality. We do need to pay attention to resilience of supply chains. Security of supplies has to be factor in economic decisions, as well as because of the uh, climate crisis and the need to shrink our carbon footprint, how far goods travel also matters. But as we do that, we should choose the least cost pathway. Uh, in our analysis, uh, we judged the uh, cost of trade fragmentation to be somewhere between 0.2% of global GDP and 7% of global GDP. Obviously, we want to be closer to 0.2% accept this cost of security of supplies, but do it thoughtfully and carefully. Over here in Europe, uh, we've uh, been focusing a lot on, again, the recent downturn in data, particularly when it comes to manufacturing. The manufacturing sector is stuck in the doldrums, particularly as well if you focus on, on Germany. And it's led some to believe that Germany is once again the sick man of Europe. Do the IMF believe and see Germany also being the sick man of Europe? Well, we, we see the German economy uh, going this year through a mild recession, uh, but we are very, fairly confident that uh, Germany would come out of it. Uh, why are we confident? Because the two big drivers for the German economy to slow down are price shock, especially gas uh, price shock, and uh, inflation requiring tightening of monetary uh, conditions. Those are both one-off, they're going to go away. What is more important for Germany is to think about the structure of its economy for the future. Uh, they, there is a path, invest in the green uh, transition. Uh, there is also a smart way to supply labor for the German economy. And, and Germany has been pretty good at that, to allow workers to add to its own uh, labor force, given that uh, demogra demography is heading uh, in the wrong direction for, for, for the German labor market. So I think that if you look at the uh, policy decisions uh, Germany is taking, they are around stimulating structural change. And of course, like any other country, structural reforms are a must. In this more uncertain world, with low gross growth prospects, concentrating on how you can increase productivity and capture the economy of tomorrow, uh, rather than being stuck in the economy of uh, yesterday. And of course, for Germany, this is uh, very visible in the need to uh, restructure the automobile uh, sector for this economy of tomorrow. Managing Director, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Giovanna Bersecchi and thank you for watching. You can check out more of our videos by clicking on the boxes on the screen. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more from CNBC International. Thank you for watching.